few weeks ago, I started a series called the Family Series. This is part three and the final installment of this, this series, uh, the Family Series. And we've been looking at Genesis chapter two, three, and four, and, and uh, looking at and addressing the challenge of how there is a calculated and concerted effort to destroy the family. The enemy is seeking to tear apart the family unit as we understand it. And we looked at, in part one, a message to singles. We're all the single people, all the single people, all the single people, all the single people, okay. We looked at the fact that the first family unit really was a single man named Adam. And we looked at and talked about that. Then part two, we dealt with spouses. Somebody say spouses. How many of y'all know that if your spouse could just get themselves together, your marriage would be just fine? <laughs> so we took a look at addressing the challenges that we have with spouses and the enemy's attempt to try to separate and bring damage to spouses. Thirdly today, I want to look at the final part of this series and we want to deal with the seed. Somebody say the seed. The seed. One more time, say the seed. the seed. Okay, all of y'all who didn't say seed, now can y'all say it this time? Say seed. The seed. The seed. God is interested in the seed. I think it's important that you and I understand that when God does something for you and I, it is not really for us. When he blesses you with a job, blesses you with a home, blesses you with resources, it's not so much for you as much as it is for your seed. God is a generational God. He thinks generational. He thinks long term. His interest is not just about the here and now. God is interested about the uh, generations from now. He's concerned about your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And so he sets up uh, provisions and resources and opportunities, not so much for you as he does so for your kids. And so he's interested in the seed. And so there is an effort of the enemy to try to mess up and destroy the seed. The devil wants your children. He wants to kill your seed. He wants to mess up your grandkids. He wants to bring drama and pain. And our desire today is to speak to this matter and try to get us on the page of understanding the importance and the value of the seed. And so with that in mind, I wanted to take a look in chapter 4 at the seeds of a a Adam and Eve, which is Cain and Abel. And here we have, uh, we have in this chapter and in this section of scripture some insight that I want to talk about for a few moments. I want to begin by my first point, which is this. I want to lay out the first point that our seed has a dynamic purpose. Our seed has a dynamic purpose. Your seed has an assignment. Your seed has a purpose. They're not just a result of mom and daddy getting together. It is not simply the result of an encounter between a, a, a man and a woman. When, the, when you have a child, there's, a, there's an assignment behind the life of that child. And we see two particular purposes that I want to lay out very quickly. The first one is in verse number, uh, I want to look at verse number 25 and 26. Well, let's look at verse 26. And it says, and has for Seth, well, let's look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth, for God had appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Verse 26, and as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. God given assignment, our seed has the assignment of calling on the name of the Lord. The God wants our children to reach a component of life, uh, a, 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 an element of life where they're calling on the name of God. Now, what does that mean? It means that wherever you are in, in God today, wherever you are in life today, God wants your children to get so much further than where you are in life. Now, I find this interesting that the Bible says in verse 26 that men began to call on the name of the Lord. What about Adam and Eve? What about Cain and Abel? All of them had relationships with God, but it wasn't until verse 26 that God says, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. It was not until verse 26. What's the, what is the, the essence here? The essence is that he says it is at that point that men begin to call on the name of the Lord. And whenever you say the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord is always a reflection of the character of God. Whenever you use God's name, his name is always ascribed to describe something about his character. 
And so here's what he is saying. It is at that point that man transitioned to a place where they can now assign character to God and they can now sense and see the makeup of the nature of God. You see, some of us, the nature of our relationship with God is so limited and so small that all we think is that God is some invisible bellhop who, to whom we let him know what our problems are and he comes and solves our problems and that's all there is. But there's so much more to the makeup of who God is. He's more than just a bellhop for you. There's a lot about the character and makeup of God. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's, he's all-knowing. He's everywhere at the same time. He's a God who sanctifies. He's a God that heals. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God to heal. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's a Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. There's so much to the nature of God. And, and, and what we begin to learn, I see in this text, that now, by the time we get to verse 26, now men begin to call on the name of the nature of God. I want my kids to be much further down the road with me, with God than I am. I want them to know more about God than I know about God. I want them to achieve more. I want them to reach more. I want their depth and the breadth of their relationship with God to be more than mine. So your children have, have an assignment and a dynamic purpose to call on God, to get to a place that's much deeper in God than you and I can achieve. Then there's a second assignment that God says about kids. Let's go to chapter 3. A second purpose for him, chapter 3, and I want to read verse 14 and 15. Verse 14 says, so the, so the Lord said to the serpent, now remember this is in chapter 3 when the devil threw, threw a serpent, tempted Eve, and she sinned, and now God speaks to the serpent, verse 14, so the, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life, verse 15. Here's God talking, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his head, his heel. Here's what it's saying. God is saying that I'm going to put a division between your seed, Satan, and the seed of of, of the woman and her seed is going to bruise your head and you'll just simply be able to tap the heel but but her seed is going to bruise your head this is a scripture that is prophetic about Jesus it is saying that Jesus is going to come along and bruise the heel bruise the head of Satan and the devil can just be able to just touch the heel but Jesus is going to be to be able to smash the head but it's not only about Jesus, it's also about our children. God is saying, I have an assignment for your kids to bring damage to the kingdom of the devil. Oh, I can't get no amen on that point right there. Let me tell you what I'm excited about. I'm excited that in this camp, God is raising up young men and young ladies who are on fire for the things of God. They're chasing after God. They're pursuing God. They're not walking around with their pants down, drug up off their butts. They're not, all of the young people ain't getting pregnant before they're married. All the young people are not strung out on drugs. There are some young people that are on fire and passionate about the things of God. Come on and give the Lord a praise about that. They're not all breaking in houses. They're not all skipping school. Some of them are graduating at the top of their class. They're going on to college. They're loving God. They're in love with Jesus. They're accomplishing some significant things. Last Sunday, last Sunday, Easter Sunday, 200 and 94 people made a decision for Jesus. That's a lot of people, 294, that's a lot of people. Now to put some, some framework to that so you understand, the average church in America, the average church in the United States of America has less than 100 people. 294 people came to Jesus last Sunday. Not from a dynamic sermon that the great dynamic Pastor Jenkins preached. It came from a drama presentation that was put on that lasted last Sunday. A 14 minute play, drama, theatrical, the, the, theatrical, 
theatrical presentation brought 294 people to Jesus and it was not a sermon from the pastor, but it was a play put on by the pastor C. My son put that play on. Oh, come on and give God some praise up in this camp. Look at here, get ready. If God can do it through my seed, guess what he might do through your seed? Somebody high five your neighbor, say God's gonna use my seed. They might be giving me drama today, but God's gonna do something through my seed. They might be bad right now, but God's gonna do something through my seed. They might be giving me pain now. I might be crying over them now. I might be concerned about them now, but I believe God's gonna do something with my seed. My seed's gonna rise up. My seed's gonna do something great. My seed's gonna accomplish something fabulous. I'm talking about y'all. I'm gonna need y'all to show a little bit more excitement because I'm talking about y'all. Y'all are the head and not the tail. You're gonna be up and not down. You're not gonna be strung out on drugs. You're not gonna sell your bodies on the streets. You're gonna be presidents of corporations. You're gonna be doctors and lawyers and preachers and pastors and politicians and you're gonna be great men and women of God. I decree it, I declare it, I say it, I promote it, I pronounce it over your lives. The devil cannot have our seed. The devil cannot destroy our seed. The devil cannot defeat our seed. The devil cannot have our seed. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to get excited about that. I know you might not see it now, but it does not yet appear what they shall be. But when Christ appears, when they see Jesus for who he is, they shall be elevated. They shall come up. They shall be promoted. Hey! our sons, release our daughters, get them off drugs, bring them out of jail, let them be mighty warriors for your kingdom, God. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. Can I just simmer right here for just a moment? Can we hang out right here? And can we just, can we just praise God for what us, our sons and daughters will be? Can we give him credit ahead of time? Ahead of time. Hey, ahead of time. Hallelujah, God. Raise them up, God. Let them fulfill their purpose. Let them reach their destiny. Let them be what you're calling them to be. Hey, hey. Streets. 
way he should go and when he is old he won't depart now they might stray but if you put the right thing in them they coming back somebody say they coming back they're coming back they're coming back all right all right Somebody better go ahead and praise him for a baby that ain't even born yet. Hallelujah. All right, all right, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Now, your, 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 your seed has a purpose. Matter of fact, Psalm 127 says, they will speak with the enemies in the gates. At the gate. I know you don't believe this, but, but at the gate, at the gate, the gate represents where the strength of the enemy is. God says, your seed is going to speak to the enemy at the gate. God's raising up a generation of young people who are going to be able to challenge the best that the devil has to offer. Woo! That's your sons. That's your daughters that will speak with the enemy at the gate. Mm. Now, but the, here's the dilemma. The dilemma is that Satan, point two, is seeking to destroy our seeds. Satan seeks to destroy our seed. We got to know that there's a calculated plan of the enemy to kill your children. The devil wants to snuff it out. And he wants to do it through two ways. Num number one, he wants to do it at the hands of another person. He wants to do it at the hand of another person. And that's what happened, that's what happened here in chapter 4 with the seed of, of Adam and Eve. One son killed the other. Cain rose up and killed Abel. And here's the problem, is that this same dilemma is facing our community because our young men are killing each other at an alarming rate. But I bind that spirit of gain right now in Jesus' name. We rebuke it. We break it. We command that spirit of being in a gang to be released. People like our sons and daughters will not get caught up in gangs. <laughs> Hallelujah. The devil wants to kill him at the hands of another. And, so, and often they're killing him over stuff that doesn't matter. Clothes and shoes and jackets and drugs and women and men and being disrespected and our sons and daughters are taking out life senselessly. It's not strangers, it's people they have relationships with. Cain and Abel went out in the field and they were talking and the anger in Cain rose up and slew his brother. Now that's the problem because some of us are carrying anger in us and resentment. Cain was mad, not because of something that Abel did, but he was upset. And I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but let me just give you a preview, preview of it. Cain was upset because they both, bought, they both bought an offering to God, and God accepted Abel's, but he didn't accept Cain's. He respected Abel's, but he didn't respect Cain's. And Cain got upset because God accepted Abel's offering, but not his. 
And some of us are, are, are being angry and hurting other people. They didn't do anything wrong, but we're upset because of what something that somebody else did. Y'all understand what I'm saying? I want to bind that right now. Some of us better learn how to grow up and stop being upset with stuff that happened years ago and stuff that other folk did. You can't keep carrying a, 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 a monkey on your back because of what happened in your childhood and what happened to you 20 years ago. Grow up, man. Come on, grow up, woman. Grow up. Get over it. Get over it. Let it go. Let it go. Forgive and roll on with life. Amen. Preach on, Pastor. I see y'all having a tough time with me right now. Most of our challenges are not coming from people that are strangers. Most of our challenges come from people that we love and that we know. Abel got killed by his brother, somebody he loved. And so some of us better be careful because it's not strangers that's going to hurt you. It's people that, that say they love you. And some of, us, some of our, us are getting messed up from people who call themselves our friends. Y'all better be careful who you let into your sphere of friendship. Everybody can't be your friend. Go on and preach, Pastor. Everybody can't be your buddy. Everybody, everybody can't be your boo. Now, I don't have face, Facebook. Is that it? Am I getting it right? I want to call it Face Page. Is it, it's not Face Page. It's Facebook. I don't have Facebook or MySpace, or any of that. But I keep getting these invitations. So-and-so wants to be your friend. Will you accept so-and-so to be your friend? Do you accept or decline? Some of y'all need to be declining. Y'all need to be hitting a decline button. Y'all ain't got to say nothing. I'm gonna go ahead and preach this thing. Some of y'all need to be declining some people in your life. Some of y'all need to be getting some folk out of your life. You need to evaluate who you're going to let be your friend because everybody who want to be your friend is not good for you. Woo, preach on, pastor. High five your neighbor. Say, everybody ain't good for you. You better evaluate. You better scope them out. You better check them out. You better see what direction they're headed in. You better find out what their focus is. What's their passion? What's their interest? Who else do they hang out with? You better find out before you let somebody be your friend who they is. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of our seeds are getting messed up by so-called friends, and some of our seeds are getting messed up by abusive parents. It's tragic how I can't get it, I can't wrap my head around parents abusing their kids. I can't comprehend it. It's, it's a level of, of uh, perverseness that blows my mind, but yet it's happening. That's abuse. Some of our seeds are being messed up by the verbal abuse that parents put on their kids. You better be careful what you say to your kids because you're speaking either life or death over them. I like that song that Myron sung. I like what he said. You, you, you're, you can speak life over them or you can speak death over them. You, you stop speaking negative to your kids. Stop downing them and dogging them and you ain't gonna never be nothing and your daddy wasn't nothing and your, you ain't gonna never be nothing. Shut up! You can't speak hope. If you can't speak victory, if you can't speak promising things over them, shut your mouth! Some of you are abusing your kids by the lifestyle that you're living in front of your kids. Oh, y'all ain't got to say nothing. Your life
lifestyle is abusing them. You coming in and out of the house, you running men through your house, you running women through your house, you drinking and smoking and lying and cussing, you are abusing your kids yourself. You and your wife fighting and arguing, you and your husband fighting and arguing, cussing at each other, calling each other names, you are abusing your kids. Y'all done made me mad now. I'm determined not to let our kids get destroyed by your foolishness. Oh God, put a shield around our kids and protect them from abusiveness. Protect them from the selfishness of their parents and the arrogance of their parents. Save them from their parents. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout with me. Pray. <laughs> Say yes, God. Some of our kids are also being abused and being destroyed. The seed is being destroyed at the hands of their own heart. Some of the seeds are being destroyed by their own hearts. What do you mean, Pastor? Look at the text with me for a moment. Look at, look at, look at verse 3. I'm going to start at verse 3 of chapter 4. It says, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the fruit, the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now I want you to get the picture here because Cain and Abel have both offered an offering to God. God accepted Abel's, but not Cain's. Cain gets upset, he gets mad, and so something enters into his heart. His heart becomes corrupted. As a matter of fact, God says to him, sin is at the door of your heart. And what is happening in our culture today is the seed is getting messed up because sin is being allowed to enter into the heart of our seeds. God said to, to, God said to Cain, you have the opportunity to do well. You have the opportunity to do well. It says right here in verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And it would be great. Listen, here's the deal. Cain and Abel are in a situation and they offer something to God. They offer an offering to God. Cain's is not accepted. He gets something in his heart. He gets mad. He gets upset. He gets angry. There's a level of angry and his countenance has fallen. And this, listen to this. God speaks to Cain about his heart. Now, this is important. If you don't remember nothing else, I say, hear this. God dealt with what was in Cain's heart. Let me tell you something. Before you sin, God always deals with what's in your heart. He will speak to you about it. He'll challenge you about it. Before you go down that road of sin, God will begin to talk to you about it. And it's up to you as to what you do about the challenge that God puts in front of you about what's in your heart or what's lying at the door of your heart. God challenged him. God spoke to him. And here's the drama. He never allowed what God spoke to him to, to, he never dealt with it. How do you know that, Pastor? Because in the very next verse, verse 8, it says, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and he came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. It means that God spoke to him about what was in his heart, and he refused to deal with it. Now, here's the problem. Here's what I'm sick of. I'm sick of grown people who should be over the drama in their life, over the pain, and be dealing with the stuff that God deals with them about, but they blow right on past what God says to you, and keep on making Making excuses to allow stuff to remain in your heart. Yeah. 
Preach on, Pastor. Y'all shouldn't have came to this service because I'm going to take my time. I'm going to tell y'all right now, don't come to the 12 o'clock service unless you're ready, you, you're willing to just hang with me till I get done. You got to rush, come to 8, come to 10, but don't come to 12 and don't come to 630 because I'm taking my time. Those are my services, I take my time. Now here's the thing, God spoke to his heart and he never dealt with it. And, and here's the role, here's an important thing too, because seeds often need the help of their parents to push them through dealing with the issues of their heart. They, need their, they, they sometimes need their parents' help. And here's a time when Adam should have been there. Adam should have been there to help Cain work through his issues. But Cain, Cain is dealing with it by himself Adam is nowhere to be found. They, they're out in the field fighting and wrestling and Adam is nowhere to be found. Matter of fact, in the whole chapter four, the only time we see Adam's name mentioned is in verse one and verse 25. In verse one he's mentioned and in verse 25 he's mentioned and both times he's having sex with his wife. Go ahead, y'all don't believe it, go ahead, read it. It's in there, go ahead, read it. <laughs> Brothers, you are more than a seed dropper. How about raising the seed? How about nurturing the seed? How about coaching the seed? How about developing the seed? You are more than just having babies. Stop spreading your seeds all over the place and how about raising your seed? Hallelujah. Y'all got my first two points? Let me give you my third and final point. Our seed need God's truth. The seed need God's truth. Our seeds need to understand and comprehend God's truth that are mentioned here in the passage. There's several mentioned. What's the first thing? The first thing that our seed needs to know is that God does have requirements for worship. God does have requirements for worship. Say that. God has requirements for worship. Now, listen, look at this. I want you to see this real quick. Again, if you don't hear nothing else I say, hear this. This is the second thing I want you to hear if you don't hear nothing else I say. Cain bought, matter of fact, in verse number three, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Cain was a tiller of the field, and he bought to, to God an offering from the fruit of the ground. Verse 4 says, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. Abel was a keeper of sheep. And both of them bought something from what their field of training was and presented it to God. And God accepted Abel's but not Cain's. And the question is, why did God accept Abel's but not Cain's? Matter of fact, here's what, look at verse number, matter of fact, it says right here in verse number four, it says in the latter part, it says, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. He uses the word respected. And what does the word respect mean? It means, it's a Hebrew word that means God was amazed, bewildered. He looked in a state of shock. God was amazed at what Abel brought, but he was not amazed at what Cain brought. What is the distinction? What is the difference? I'm glad you asked the question. Because in verse four, Abel brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat. When Abel bought an offering to God, he went to his sheep and he bought the best. He bought the fattest. He, he didn't bring some diseased sheep. He didn't bring no crippled sheep. He didn't bring no spotted sheep. He bought the best he could find. He bought the best that he had. 
But Cain, on the other hand, it says he brought an offering. And the word offering in the Hebrew means he brought a donation. I punched y'all in the gut with that, didn't I? You see, here's the problem. Some of us want God to give us a supernatural miracle of blessings while we are just giving him a donation in our worship. But if you want God to do something supernatural, if you want God to be amazed at what you give, what you would, if you want him to be amazed at you, then bring him the best. I don't know where y'all are, but when I write my tithes and offerings to God, it, I don't pay my tithes to God after I done paid my mortgage and my electric bill and my cable bill. Before I pay anything else, I give God right off the top. When I give him my time, I start off the first day of the week giving him the first hours of my day. I start off the first day of the week giving him the top of my day and the top of my life. I give him the best that I have. Woo! I am preaching up in here, up in here. Some of y'all have been giving God a donation. You're throwing in the 12 o'clock service, just to say. You throw in a $5 bill and think God ought to be happy. Cain's offering was rejected because it was not the best that he had. Abel's was accepted because he picked the juiciest, best, first, most valuable thing he had and brought it to God and said here you ought to give God your best because when we needed a savior and we needed salvation and we needed deliverance God didn't send no angel he didn't send no second best he sent the best that he had for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but they shall have everlasting life he gave us his only begotten son somebody give God a praise for that oh don't patty cake the Lord let's give him a real offer hallelujah as a matter of fact what Abel offered God required the shedding of some blood and when you give something to God you ought to give something to God that you feel it when you give it you ought to, matter of fact our practice in our life ought to be incorporate this into your life that you have to think about whether you want to give really do I really want to give give, give God all of that that's what your offering ought to be do I really want to do I want to go all that way do I want to give him all that money do I want to give him that much time do I want to give him that much energy do I want to give him that part of my gifting you ought to have to think about it if you can give it and you don't feel it then you ain't giving anything when you bring it to God David said I will not present something to God that has not cost me something. Woo! I wish I had a praying crowd with me today that we ought to bring our offering to God and it ought to cost us something. Somebody tell your neighbor, it ought to cost you something. Tell him on the other side, it ought to cost you something. It ought to cost you some time. It ought to cost you where you feel it in your heart. It ought to, it ought to cause you to have to step back and think about it. Hallelujah. I'm preaching better than y'all are saying amen. Who am I preaching to today? I know God's talking to you. I know God's ministering to you. It's time for you and I to make a choice and make a decision to say, God, I'm not going to hold back anymore. God, I'm not going to give you second best anymore. God, I'm not going to give you my crumbs anymore. I'm not going to give you halfway anymore. God, I'm going to give you my best. Today's dynamic message from Pastor Jenkins is one that has the power to change your life, but it can only do so if you have a heart and soul that belong to Jesus Christ. Perhaps you want to be able to make such a claim, but you don't know how. It's simple. 
You just have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again with all power. Your sins are now forgiven and you're part of the family of God. Welcome. Maybe you're already saved and in need of a church home, one that will nurture your growth and development as a Christian. Or perhaps you were once in fellowship with God but have since drifted away and are ready to return to your first love. Whatever the case, we'd love to have you become a part of the First Baptist family. Simply contact us at 301-773-3600 or visit our website at www.fbcglenarden.org for more information on any one of our four convenient services or our 100 plus ministries designed to meet your most intimate needs. First Baptist Church of Glen Arden, where God is developing dynamic disciples.